Mr President, within a few years of entering the veterinary profession, I felt an absolute failure, my self-esteem at an all-time low and my anxiety through the roof. I can't talk on behalf of all veterinarians, Mr President, but I want to share some of my experience and the facts and statistics back up that the people in this profession deserve a platform to share their experiences, their trauma and to have real change to a profession that has frankly been in crisis too long. Veterinarians are dying, Mr President, by suicide at a rate four times higher than the general population, two times higher than other medical professions like doctors and dentists. Many remaining are depressed and anxious. Almost half at any one time are looking to get out. My question though is, do those staying know how tough they have it? A 2020 Monash University study revealed that 70% of veterinarians have lost a peer or colleague to suicide. Six in 10 sought professional mental health care. And according to the Australian Veterinary Association, 88% of veterinarians have poor mental health as a result of a toxic work environment resulting from consumer abuse and unreasonable unre expectations. There have been reports that some veterinarians earn less per hour than someone at McDonald's, Mr President. Veterinarians do not earn a lot of money. Mr President, the median salary of a veterinarian in South Australia has been reported to be as low as $75,000 a year. Sorry, Mr President, is it all right? I'm just getting distracted by the chatter that's next to me. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I want to acknowledge right at the beginning, Mr President, Gary and Kate Putland, who in honour of their daughter Sophie, lost to this profession at the age of 33, established Sophie's legacy. Sophie's legacy, to my knowledge, have done more to help activate awareness and demand real change than has been seen before in this profession. Gary and Kate have a deep understanding of the challenges of this profession and I have sought their advice and feedback on the terms of reference, as well as looking at interstate and federal examples. I also want to acknowledge my veterinary colleagues, Mr. President. I have the utmost respect for anyone entering and working this profession. Mr. President, how long can we hide behind the fake narrative that veterinary suicide is down to compassionate personalities and access to medications? When will the cover-up of the unacceptable working conditions and remuneration end? I'm calling on this parliament to support an inquiry into the veterinary profession. This is to be no tick box exercise. The people in this chamber speak often of caring for the mental well-being of the South Australians we represent. Yes, we come at it from different viewpoints and different angles, but I'm sure we can agree. We love our pets. Well, it's time we start loving our vets and understanding the true cost of veterinary care. I want to see real government investment in improving the lives of veterinarians as an outcome to this inquiry. The positive impact of veterinarians on the wider community cannot be underestimated. Mental health and wellbeing, food production, wildlife, biosecurity, research. Mr President, I've spoken in this chamber before of my schooling difficulties, attending no less than five different high schools in different states. But after bringing myself back from the brink of academic disaster and achieving a university entrance score of 99.7, honoured with ducks of my school, I thought I'd finally discovered my path to success. Oh. Hard work, dedication, perseverance, believing in myself, I could do anything, Mr President. Wrong. Like many others before and after me, after topping my studies and pursuing years of rigorous full-time study to obtain my first-class veterinary degree and disproportionately high hex debt, I found myself disillusioned and depressed with this dream profession. I've worked as a veterinarian both in the United Kingdom and Australia. There seems to be a global problem with the veterinary industry, although I'm aware of changes in the business model in the United States that show promise improving the industry. I remember an experience where I was the only veterinarian at the practice for the weekend living above the clinic. I had weekend consults and hospital patients. One patient, a 60 kilogram bull mastiff, suffering with hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. This poor dog was regularly vomiting and producing voluminous bloody diarrhea. All alone, Mr. President, I lifted the dog in and out of his cage, cleaned it, medicated him, put him back. But then this poor dog just started again more blood, vomit and faeces. It was a seemingly physically and mentally distressingly endless process. 
I just repeatedly lifted this dog in and out alone, cleaning the cage of vomit, blood and faeces and my clothes for the entire weekend. I had other patients and duties, Mr President. I felt I couldn't eat or hydrate myself properly, Mr President, and at the end I almost physically collapsed. I know there are worse horror stories. One of my first practices, I was paid $45,000 a year and $30 to take the phone for the night. I could work all night, but it was $30 and back at 7.30 a.m. One night, with a veterinary student in tow, I just drove straight through a farmer's fence after doing a carving in the early hours of the morning. It was dangerous exhaustion, but there I was, back doing a full day of work straight. I remember doing my first gastric surgery on a puppy that had eaten a sock, alone, with the veterinary nurse and a textbook out. It was Christmas Day. I went home and fell asleep in my bed in a soiled veterinary smock. It's a tough profession and we do hear about the challenges with stress and dealing with sick animals, clients and emergencies, but we need to start recognising the high aptitude and resilience of these veterinarians who are succumbing to unrealistic pressures. Mr President, we also hear the, about the access to lethal barb and we hear about the trauma of euthanasia and the subsequent desensitisation to the process. Indeed, I remember my first animal euthanasia so clearly. And after that, it's a blur as I tuned out to save my soul from it. My first euthanasia was a German shepherd with liver cancer. I'd cared for him in hospital. He was utterly depressed. As the deeply loving family came to see him for the final consultation and agreed euthanasia, this dog, Mr. President, just looked so full of joy in his mind with relief of going home. He bounded around and wagged his tail, eyes fixed on his owners. Sure, it was fleeting vigour, but it was significantly moving. The family, understandably distressed, started instructing me, just do it now, do it quickly. And so I injected Mr President, and the slowing down of the tail and the slumping of his body, the memory is totally vivid today, almost 20 years later. I couldn't tell you how many animals I've put down since, Mr President. You get desensitised. But unfortunately, many in the public would be shocked to know that the greatest stress is actually trying to manage the full day, with the euthanasia often booked in unexpectedly or squeezed into the schedule. Vets are so under the pump trying to care for a family's loss while themselves utterly exhausted. The greatest challenge can become just getting it done in time and surviving the pressure of the rest of the day. It's a hard job and there is access to lethal barb, but veterinarians are not, in my opinion, taking their lives because they put down a poodle, for example, and have access to drugs. I don't think many with children at home or a loving family end their life over a client's pet. That's not to say this doesn't affect them, but it's important to stop hiding behind this narrative because it stops those responsible addressing the often barbaric working conditions with totally unacceptable remuneration. In one of my attempted escapes from this profession, I obtained a postgraduate qualification from King's College in London, topping my year and awarded with the Blackwell Prize for Most Promising Teacher. Teaching was such a fantastic time in my life. If only the qualification were directly recognised here in Australia, Mr President, I would probably have continued with it. I've taught at the most disadvantaged schools overseas, closed by government due to uncontrollable student behaviour. I remember my first day at a college in Kent, England, car keys stolen in five minutes, Mr President, police called to manage lunchtime violence. It was a relief from veterinary practice. This is no slight on teachers, Mr President, it's just that for me this is a factual statement. And I support a significant pay rise for teachers, Mr President, who, infect, who effectively increase engagement, attendance and academics, especially in these challenging environments. At the closure of my first teaching placement, the principal gave a short speech on our contribution on hearing the principal, Vincent O'Mara, say, Sarah, you won't be a good teacher, you'll be an excellent one. I thought this was a highlight of my life, Mr President, and I wish I'd told this to Vincent, who put up with many occasions of his door flung open as I wished to discuss ideas to turn the school around. Unfortunately, after being brought in as an excelling principal elsewhere to rescue this failing school, he passed away shortly after from cancer. After embarking on this new teaching career, applying my well-trodden principle of hard work, dedication, perseverance, the feedback from the workplace seemed to shift to, go home, look after yourself, good job. What happened to be smarter, work harder, stay later? That's all I understood from my veterinary career. Suddenly finding myself being told to relax, not work so hard, when I'd never worked less. Mr President, it was a challenge to my inner negative thinking. This is no general attack on the teaching profession, it's just a factual statement of my experience. I was working less and being paid more. Many veterinarians are earning less than teachers. It's one of the worst paid professions. 
I found myself in my next college, a Beacon College for other public schools, being praised again. And upon receiving a letter from the college to my home address, I had to read it twice to confirm that no, I wasn't being let go. It read, Dear Sarah, I wanted to write in order to thank you for your exceptional teaching last year, which resulted in so many youngsters in your care achieving brilliant exam results. Your excellence as a teacher, inspirational delivery, means that the young people taught by you have a major advantage, results in the bank, which they would be unlikely to have achieved had they been taught by anyone else. I am so lucky, Mr President, to be able to stand here today, having survived my experience in the veterinary profession and share some other successes I've had. Many have lost their lives, astounding potential within the profession and outside, gone forever from the community. In closing, Mr President, I would say to our pet-loving nation that the veterinarian you see in the morning is often the same veterinarian you see in the evening, maybe the same veterinarian who worked the weekend and may have worked through that night. Client complaints can be a significant source of stress and worry for veterinarians. I've never met a veterinarian who wasn't an overachiever trying their absolute best and better community understanding of pressure on veterinarians is needed. Many veterinarians don't feel they have time to eat or hydrate properly in the day. People need to find out how long is your consultation, be on time, stick to the time, book for a double appointment if you need it. Don't be the reason that your veterinarian doesn't have lunch that day. We need to get real about the cost of owning a pet, Mr President. We need to reconsider current veterinary business models that are not cost effective. Frankly, after having attempted to survive the veterinary profession myself, I'm surprised there are any veterinarians left in the profession at all. We associate veterinarians with compassion and love for animals, with intelligence and hard work. It's all true, Mr President. What we don't hear so much is just how resilient and capable veterinarians are, and yet they are topping the list for dying from suicide. Let's not keep asking veterinarians to be more resilient and manage stress better while insisting they work in toxic work environments so brutal almost no one else could stand it. It's time for change, Mr President. I commend the motion to the Chamber. Oh, Mr Hunter.